One today is Monday, November 22nd, 2010. We are at a committee of the whole meeting. Could all please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance, please? Thank you. And at this time, I'd like to establish a quorum. Clerk Spencer, if you can please call the roll, please. Gutenkopf. Here. Kaza. Here. Shea. Here. Leader. Here. Rose. Here. Rose. Here. Graham. Here. Hitskin. Here. York. Here. Healy. Here. Morley. Here. Kennedy. Here. Mulliner. Here. Wagner. Here. 13 present, zero absent. 13 present, zero absent. We have an official quorum. First item on the agenda, uh, after we just finished closed session, is the overview of stormwater system, Christopher Burke, engineering, uh, city staff. Take it away, City Manager Borchert. Yes, uh, I apologize that we had some pressing litigation matters we just had to finish. It's made us late. We apologize for that. We'll, we'll kick right into our PowerPoint presentation as quickly as possible. And uh, FYI, I, I will stay after the Committee of the Whole meeting with the mayor to uh, work with the task force and, and answer more detailed questions to allow the other committee members to, to move on to their otherwise scheduled uh, evening meetings. Uh, I would announce, uh, I have determined working with Commonwealth Edison that they have committed to, we haven't seen it yet, but they have committed to coming to a a workshop similar to this where they will be reporting to the Elmhurst community their, their, the results of their analysis of their, of their service and of their commitment to uh, reinforce the system for the uh, committee meeting night, first, first committee meeting night in December. So it would be December 13th, I believe that's just December 13th. Uh, we will have a scheduled committee, the whole meeting before committees again allowing Commonwealth Edison to report on, on their, their work, their effort that we've been asking them for. And Mr. Uh, Hughes will go through the PowerPoint that has been prepared by the Burke team uh, as part of, their, part of their consulting assignment with, again, City of Elmhurst input as to operations to, uh, to a limited extent. Mr. Hughes. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Mayor and City Council. Um, as Tom said, this is the fourth of the education um, sessions that we've been having, and this one will focus on the storm sewer system. I think uh, you've seen this picture before. This is the, uh, the basically the city of Elmhurst there. Uh, oops. It's the main rectangle is Elmhurst, Grand Avenue, down here to Butterfield. And that line that you see down the middle, the green dashed line is the uh, watershed divide line. Maybe just to reiterate, to, to um, uh, talk about it again, the state, all, all land is made up of a series of watersheds, basically bowls. I use the analogy of dimples on a golf ball, but the dimples are all different sizes, different shapes, different depths. And so there's ridges in between the dimples. That ridge would represent the, the edge of two of them. And so to the north is the, uh, northeast is the Addison Creek drainage area, and to the south and west is the area that drains to Salt Creek. This is a, uh, an interesting map that our GIS department put together. Um, it's basically a contour map, but they assigned shades of color to the contours. So as you see on the left there, red is higher and green is low. Um, down the middle there is Salt Creek. That really dark green area is the quarry. I believe that red dot is the uh, um, sledding hill up in Barron's Park. So as you can see along the ridge, you know, it's, it's higher here, lower on through the creek, and then higher as you get back into Villa Park. So we tend to have more of the problems in that green area than in the, in the red. Um, basics of what a storm sewer system is, it's obviously a system that's designed to collect water from streets, driveways, roofs, downspouts, and convey it all to the, uh, to the uh, collecting stream, in, our, in this case Salt Creek for the most part, Addison Creek uh, going the other way. Um, a lot of times it does have to be lifted to a, a lift station on its way. You can see here again, we talked before about a separated system that the city of Elmhurst has. The blue is the storm sewer system. The red is the, uh, 
the gray water that goes to the treatment plant before and is treated before it returns to the uh, to the river. The city has over 130 miles of storm sewer of varying sizes. We maintain eight uh, stormwater pumping stations to help convey stormwater to Salt Creek. Uh, all of them are located al along the creek, as you can see, with this one exception, which drains uh, water into the lower Elmhurst Reservoir, which is that reservoir located between 290 and 294. And that is a, a reservoir on the Addison Creek system. Here's a, a chart that shows you the various sizes, the size ranges, and the amount of miles that the city has of each. Obviously, in the storm sewer system, smaller pipes feed bigger pipes that feed even bigger pipes. So we have a lot more of the smaller pipes um, that would be running down your residential street and eventually getting into larger and larger pipes. Another overview of the sewer system. Um, this again shows all of the lift stations that are located in Elmhurst as well as some of the larger storm lines that, that are within the city system. It does indicate in blue several detention facilities, the, the Elmhurst Quarry, the Elders Reservoir. Those are both uh, facilities located on Salt Creek. And then you have a number of small detention facilities. This is the uh, Lower Elmhurst Reservoir right there that are all uh, help with the uh, Addison Creek system. You can see that a lot of these lines all lead directly to lift stations because that's once they get there, then they're lifted into the creek. But there are some, such as Butterfield Road, which is gravity all the way. There is no lift station on that one. The, uh, the city d has required detention. I, I got here in 1985. We had detention requirements then for commercial development. It wasn't really mandated by the county until 1992, and they made them much stricter. Basically, prior to that, any commercial development that was required to, was only allowed to run off what that site would have run off if it was grass. So if you had a completely grass site and you came in, you wanted to build a large building with a parking lot, which would have a lot of impervious, you know the size of the lot, you know the, the slope of the lot, you put a storm on it, you see how much water runs off if it was grass. Now you put your project on it, you see how much more water runs off with the, the increase in impervious you had to detain that differential so that the water was still only going off on grass. S since 1992, you're allowed about 10% of what comes off of grass per the county requirement. So it's much more restrictive than, than pretty much anywhere else in the country. Um, relative to the storm pumping stations, and we'll have a little, we've got kind of a, a moving slide that will kind of demonstrate this in a minute here, but basically, all the pumping stations are located at the creek. They're, they, all of the main storm sewers that leave Elmhurst flow by gravity all the time. And it's only when the water either really comes up fast or if the creek comes up that we have to, that the pumps start running. But any low flows, we're not paying electricity, we're not paying to pump it, they just go out by gravity and you'll, you'll see that in a minute. But once the, once the creek comes up, then the lift stations have to be uh, kicked down and that's all automatic. You can see in the last bullet point, the pumping rates at the, lifting, at the lift stations are restricted by the state and the county. We can't add more pumps. No one can in Illinois. We'd like to add some, but Oak Brook and Point South wouldn't appreciate it. We don't want, you know, Palatine adding pumps. So we can replace a pump that breaks. We can, you know, we can, we can maximize our pumping capacity we have, but we can't take a 30,000 gallon per minute pump out and put a 60,000 in it. They wouldn't allow it. So we are, uh, held to that, that restriction. Here's the eight lift stations that the, the city owns, um, number of pumps at each, their capacity in cubic feet per second, and the backup power supplies. Crowley Woods is a fairly small station. We, we utilize a portable generator if we have to go up and, and back that up. Um, we do have a, a number that have dual com ed feeds. We did see a problem with that, obviously, this summer. Um, that was, has been reported to me, that was the first time both feeds have gone down in 20 plus years. Um, but I think it's something that the comprehensive plan will look at relative to is that enough insurance to make sure you have power or should there be a generator um, uh, added to some of those facilities. Generators are very expensive, so it's 
there'll be a, uh, a decision that'll have to be made. This is the slide that moves that, that talks, it's an example of how a lift station works. This is the Harrison uh, Street lift station. It's, the vertical scale is not the same as horizontal. But you see as the creek starts to come up, it just, it'll just keep replaying. As the creek starts to come up, you'll see it's flowing from Harrison sewer into the creek. And until the creek is high enough that a flap gate or a sluice gate gets closed, then the Harrison Street lift station kicks on. So the pump stations flow by gravity until they're needed. If there was not a flap gate or a sluice gate, we would just be recirculating that water and not accomplishing anything. And then obviously once the rain has subsided, the pump runs for a while, then the creek comes back down and the inflow reduces and then the pump can kick off. And that's where you'll see the, the water in the street start going back down. At this point, if the rain stops, the system can catch back up and eventually the pump goes off. The flood insurance rate map, this is the, the, the flood insurance map that FEMA puts out that is regulatory. Um, if you're in the floodplain, you have to have flood insurance. This is the map after the, uh, the levee was constructed. The red over near the creek is the, uh, oops, my gosh, is the levee um, that the city constructed in the late 80s. That took a big chunk of southwest Elmhurst out of the regulatory floodplain. But there are several areas that are low-lying, which the FEMA said that those had to stay in the floodplain, South Spring Road and then the Sailor Jackson area. There's a few streets, some up in Olive and Surf area. And uh, in those cases, water just can't get out fast enough in the 100-year flood and you have some ponding. Um, and, and you have large amounts of area that are running to these, to these low-lying areas. And as you see here, the 10 to 20 times the size of the the size of the tributary area, area is 10 to 20 times larger than those sewers are sometimes designed um, for what it would normally be handling. As an example, here's Washington Street. Washington Street, the inlets in Washington Street aren't just getting water from Washington Street. They're getting Washi water from the north and from the east, and it's all making its way there. Um, you know, water wants to roll downhill, obviously, and that's where it's going. One of the things we're asking the consultant to look at in the comprehensive plan is in this area, there is no overland route. There's nowhere for the water to go. There's no low spot that it can get out by. So one of the, the, one of the tasks that we're gonna charge the, the eventual consultant for the comprehensive plan, is there a way to get it out overland? Is there some way to, to regrade backyards and side yards and get it to, to a place where it is safe to take it, but gets it out of there? because the sewers that are in all of these streets have a finite capacity. The inlets have a finite capacity. A certain size pipe only carries X amount of water, and once they're exceeded, they're not gonna take any more. But if we could relieve it at an elevation that is below where homes take water by just letting it roll by gravity, that would be an ideal situation. As it is right now, and you see the final bullet there, you know, when the low areas fill up, then the, the yards flood, the streets flood, and eventually the homes flood as well. <clears throat> a little bit about storm sewer design. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, storm sewers, as we sort of talked about during the uh, sanitary sewer uh, discussions with the separation in the 60s, it was decided to install a separate storm sewer so that the, the clean water that was going to the sanitaries wouldn't be going there anymore and uh, would eventually help clean up the, uh, the creek. Um, in the 60s, design was for a 10-year storm event, which is what it is today. Um, the 10-year 10 10, the 10 storm, the 100-year storm, I personally wish FEMA and USGS had different nomenclature. <clears throat> it's a statistical number. It has a 10-year storm has a 10% chance of happening in any year, but there's a 10% chance of a two-hour storm and a half-hour storm and a, and a and a 24-hour storm, they all have a 10% chance, so it's cumulative. It's not really a 10% chance, it's 10 chance, 10 chance of a storm of a certain duration. <clears throat> but that's the nomenclature they use, and it, it does give you a relative feel for a 100-year storm is probably 10 times bigger than a 10-year storm. Um, but what's happened over the years, since the 60s to now, is uh, FEMA and USGS, they're always looking at rainfall data, and they've noticed that rainfalls have increased. So. Back in the 80s, they had what's called technical bulletin 70, 
and they increased the amounts of rain that went with any given year storm. So what was a 10-year storm in, uh, in the 60s is probably about an eight-year <coughs> eight storm right now. You know, this, this storm storm in Elmhurst is the same as uh, almost any other communities in, in Northeast Elmhurst, uh, designed to the local county and state uh, standards. There's not, a, there's not a community in Northeast Elmhurst that has a storm sewer that's able to handle the June and July events. This is why we're looking to try to improve it and come up with ways to, if you can't get rid of the water, how can you have the water in places where it doesn't hurt anything? This is, a, this is the newspaper article you actually should have gotten with your packet today. It's kind of hard to read. This is a synopsis that, was, um, that we got from the library, but this was back in 1959 when the city was making the decision to install the, the separated storm sewers. And you can see there, oops, sorry. About two thirds of the way down, Ellie Woodman, who was the city's uh, consultant at the time, said that they were gonna try to design a storm sewer that would handle two inches of rain per hour. So that was about the 10 year storm back then. Um, so that's, that's what they designed and that's what it was designed to and for. So that's, that's the capacity that it has right now. June and July, uh, a little recap. Incredible events, four and a half inches in 30 minutes. I mean, I've never seen anything like that in my life. Uh, the consultants say that approximates about a 500 year storm. Then a month later, six and eight, almost seven inches in 12 hours, actually, I think most of it fell in about seven hours. Again, approximately 150 year storm event. So if you remember back to the sheet, the, the, the drawing of the um, flood insurance rate map, which had the 100 year, the blue areas on there were the 100 year. These two events exceeded the 100 year, so areas that weren't blue also got, saw water during that event. This is, the, this is a USGS graph of the rainfall at the Elmhurst Creek uh, gauge on uh, July 23rd and 24th. So you can see we were at zero inches and went up to about seven. That's about, total is about 16 hours, but from the point where it really starts to climb to where it starts to flatten out, is about seven hours. So that, that's a significant event. This graph here is the, the curved lines you see, those are the, the technical bulletin uh, rainfall numbers. So the bottom lines, the blue dash is a five year. Uh, the top one is the, the solid red on top is 100 and you got 50, 25 and 10 in between. Um, so this goes back to what I was saying, that you have, a, you have a percentage of happening for every duration. So there's a four hour, an eight hour, 12 hour storm, all that have a 1% chance of happening, so I think the I think the line kind of gives a better graphical image of what what the probabilities are. We've plotted the four four of the larger events that we've had. And this doesn't even have the, the October 2006 event on it, but on the left you can see the June event from uh, from near four and a half inches in, in 30 minutes is kind of off the charts. Then the July event, uh, 6.84 in 12 hours, again pretty off above the 100 year the September 2008, right at the 100 year, and then the August 87, nine and a half inches in 24 hours. Again, probably on the order of 500 year. These lines in the 60s were a little lower, and there's also talk that these lines are going to be raised again because FEMA and USGS, their data is telling them we're getting more rain. So like the adjustment they made in the 80s, they may make another one uh, in the near future. This, is, uh, this was in the Trib and online, and uh, it's uh, uh, from uh, Skilling's uh, weather forecast. It's just one of those uh, pieces of data that, that we have that kind of highlights what we were up against this summer. You know, I've been, as I said, I've been here since 85, so I've, I've been through some events, but since 2006, the number of events we've had and the intensity are really, you know, unprecedented. Here you can see, uh, oops, gosh darn it, sorry about that. In the uh, seven inches in Elmhurst here, this is the uh, July one. Again, fourth wettest July um, 
ever and the third biggest two-day rain event in 140 years with the largest being 1987. So we're talking about some really significant events. The question is, is the probability, is, is the probability of seeing these increasing? And a lot of what we're hearing is yes. We were at a, uh, a conference down at the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District uh, about a month or so ago discussing the summer storms and one of, the, one of their consultants there was a, a scientist was saying that what they're seeing is, which is sort of unusual, they're not seeing an increase in the annual rainfalls. Those are staying the same, but the individual events are just much more intense. So why, I, I don't know what that's what their data is showing them. So, in, in the oddest thing of all of this, which just baffles me, is in 2005, we were trying to figure out how to keep the trees we were planting alive. We were buying gator bags and everything. Elmhurst, I mean, Elmhurst, Illinois, and Illinois, Northeast Illinois was, was uh, designated a, a severe drought by USGS in 2005, and then in 2006, I don't know what happened, but something happened. It's been very uh, wet since then. Um, reviewing on the rear yard drain program, the city's had a rear yard drain program, I think going back to the 60s. I ran it when I first got here. It used to be the city installed six drains a year. It went to the people with the worst problems. Generally, we said you had to have standing water for 24 or 48 hours, couldn't grow grass, that kind of thing. But then when the city went through the sump pump disconnect program, they realized we're gonna have a lot of people shooting their sump pumps at each other and having a lot of neighborhood disputes and it was kind of a quality of life issue and it was a decision made that we would really up the rear drain program and so since 1991 we've installed over a thousand currently the city pays 50 percent up to a thousand dollars and these are nuisance eliminators they're not flood prevention devices but um so that that's how the rear drain program kind of came around and how it got expanded um it's also been We've also been tying in new homes uh, that were constructed. There's kind of a new home versus old home debate about which is worse for stormwater, and there's, there's pluses and minuses to both. One, one thing that we've been able to prove to ourselves and our, our consultants have confirmed for us, the new homes, and as hard as it is to believe, they're huge, they're high, they're big, that a lot of times they don't have more impervious. We just took 10 random ones a couple of years ago of teardowns and buildups, and literally there was a couple outliers that went one way or the other, but for the most part, it only changed by a couple percent on the total impervious. And the main reason is because you have a, you know, you have a smaller house in the old case, but you have a detached garage, driveway goes all the way back, so your total impervious was actually fairly high. So th we don't think that's been that impactive. Um, the other thing that, that we've required is is for them to to hook their downspouts into and, and some pump into the hard pipe to the storm sewer, which does add to the capacity or add to the amount of water the storm sewer has to carry. But in a lot of these old homes, they had the sanitary footing or the footing drains were tied to the sanitary. So we've had a little bit of a negative impact on the storm sewer side of things, huge positive impact on the sanitary side of things because the sanitary pipe is smaller and these footing drains put a lot of water in. So, so you know, it's something we've watched, and it is something I think that we'll have the consultant review and look over our shoulder when they do the comp plan to make sure that how we're doing things is is, is how it should be. If, if I may, Mr. Hughes, in addition, the city has gone back and looked at the original design done by Baxter and Wilmer back in the late 60s and compared that in the late 60s to the city of Elmhurst today. And for the most part, it's the same community. The size of the community hasn't changed. We have a few annexations at the, at the south end of town, but it has not significantly changed the, the drainage area. And all of, the, all of the runoff assumptions done by the consultants in the 60s was for what they refer to as maximum build out of the property. So whether the lot was vacant or asphalt, the consultant designed the storm sewer capacity for the for the maximum ultimate build out of the of the community and all of the community paid special assessments for their fair share of that storm sewer and and therefore have a right for their fair share of that storm sewer so 
I have had some folks say from time to time, the system overflows when it rains. Don't let anybody else connect to the storm sewer system. Basically, that would be illegal for Elmhurst not to allow folks to connect to the storm sewer system because they paid for it, they've got a right for it. Elmhurst does make sure that the amount of water that runs off of the lot is the amount of water that used to run off relative to the maximum runoff done by the consultants when they did their design. Uh, the residential neighborhood have always allowed for a 30% lot coverage. That hasn't changed. There might have been a vacant lot, but the sewer was again designed for 30% of that lot to shed and 70% to stay uh, not, not with a structure. So we have gone back and reconciled today versus when the system was designed and, and things are still as they, as they should be. Thanks, Tom. <clears throat> flood reduction improvements. I mean, this is this is where we're heading. We want to try to reduce flooding um, everywhere we can. We can, but I think it's important to note that again, like I said before, the systems always have a finite capacity. So there'll be a certain design that it will be able to handle any improvement, and beyond that, there will be trouble. So it's just important to remember that. Also. In some cases, there may be a unique problem to an individual residence. We want to look at that. Maybe, maybe there's a better way to, to spend money that is going to help protect that home without having to do a major overhaul to, to the infrastructure. Maybe there's something we can do more localized. And, um, and some, of the, some of the larger fixes that we would look at, you know, they do require cooperation between agencies and even, even private parties. So. Um, you know, schools, parks, and forest preserve districts, that's where the open land is, so it does take cooperation if we were going to try to utilize those. Um, green infrastructure, that will definitely be part of the process going forward. Um, certainly a lot of good comes out of uh, utilizing green infrastructure. Uh, more of it is probably water quality than quantity. Water quality is really the 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 buzzword today, it's where the EPA is going. It's the second part of the Clean Water Act to try to clean up the streams. So it's becoming a big deal. Um, it has been a big deal for a while, but, but a lot of it is designed to catch that first flush that has oils and sediments in it. And so beyond that, it's not much of a, it, it doesn't have as great an impact on, on controlling storm, storm water runoff. But some of the things that we'll be looking at as, as ways the city can support are rain gardens, uh, pervious pavement, green roofs, swales, rain barrels, um, all of those things will help and anything that can reduce it is a good thing. Um, you start getting into costs again because some of those things, some are very inexpensive but some are fairly expensive. Um, the, uh, again, the, the main focus of green infrastructure is water quality which is a great thing and what needs to be pursued, that's for sure. But as an example, our little example here, a 10 year storm which 24 hours um, to control it, to contain that volume in, uh, over Elmhurst would require uh, 8.7 million rain barrels. So obviously it's not, it's not gonna be the total fix. It's part of a solution, part of the fix. Some possible solutions, and I, and I reiterate, these are possible solutions that we'll, we'll expect the consultant that's eventually chosen to look at. Some may be viable, some may not. One that we, we think is viable, in fact, that we'll be talking about later tonight, Public Works, is possibly utilizing what's called variable frequency drives at the stormwater stations. A lot of them have them. Um, I know Jackson does not, and that's what we're looking at tonight. Um, variable frequency drive allows a pump to run faster or slower depending on need. Some, sometimes a pump, when you install it, it's got one speed full out. This lets it vary. So. At a, say, for instance, at the Jackson lift station, we can, that pump has to cycle on and off right now because it draw, draws the wet well down, turns itself off, there's an off period, then it turns it back, itself back on. If we can put a variable, free, frequency, variable frequency drive on it, the pump could be slowed down a little bit but run continuously so it will be putting more water out over time. So we're not violating anything permittable. We get the same pump, same capacity, maybe just using it a little more efficiently. So I think this has some uh, definite potential. Again, we can't increase the pumping capacity without offsetting it in some way with detention or some other type of channel modification. 
here's, uh, and this is just for illustration, but here's three sites in Southwest Elmhurst where there's the potential to perhaps create a detention pond of some sort. Um, you know, some of these have been looked at in the past. Um, um, that right there, where am I there? Is that Jackson there? No. Yeah. yeah that's Jackson. That's Jackson. So that is, that's Brian there, right? Okay, Wagner Center, right, gotcha. So what would happen, and if these were all dug down five feet deep, you would create 38 acre feet of storage. Um, that's a sizable amount of storage. Would it fix everything in Southeast Elmhurst? Uh, you know, there's a lot, of, a lot of engineering has to go into that because the way these are utilized is you gotta get the water to them, out of the street and to them, and then pump them out later. It's not just dig a hole and let the water flow in because water is, you know, will seek its own elevation. You'd have water in the hole and water in the street. So eventually, these are the type of things that could be looked at. But again, it takes cooperation between different uh, public entities. And these are the kind of things we want the consultant looking at in the ultimate comp comprehensive plan. Another possible solution, we kind of mentioned it earlier, is when you have the, the flood prone areas, they're low areas and their only outlet is a storm sewer, is there a way to create an overland flow route through swales, uh, backyard, uh, uh, swales and backyards and side yards and areas between houses and try to set up an overland flow route that would be, would allow water to flow out of there before it reached the, the lowest point of entry in that neighborhood. So that's, and there again, there's a lot that goes into that. You gotta find the route, you gotta be able to send it somewhere where it doesn't cost someone else a problem. So there's a lot of engineering, but again, it's, it's the type of solution that we'll be asking the consultant to look at. <coughs> uh, increasing pipe sizes, um, this leads into the, you know, to that situation where we can't send more into the creek. So if you increase pipe sizes, you have to be able to do something with the water that you're moving, whether, or, whether you're using the pipe itself as storage or you're shipping it to an open area to, to take it temporarily and take relief, relieve some pressure off of the existing storm sewer in an area. Um, and again, the cost is, is significant, but um, um, again, local detention in a flood prone area, you know, could potentially be provided. And again, that's the kind of thing you gotta be looking at for, for the final solution here, because it's gonna be a combination of a number of things. There's probably not one silver bullet that's gonna fix fix everything. And then of course there's, again, that, that's all on the public side, but there are private flood proofing enhancements that can, be, can occur, which you know we would encourage people to look at in your own individual home and we'd be happy to meet with you and go take a look at your house and see if any of these are applicable. But you've got, <clears throat> excuse me, glass block windows, raised window wells, your grading around your house, is it getting water away? Um, Driveway modification, we have a number of downslope driveways which are problematic. Um, all of these really need to be, they're private property enhancements. They probably, they should be looked at by a professional so you make sure you're not pushing the problem to someone else. And of course, most of those do require uh, permits and, and city uh, oversight, but they're definitely something that could be another piece to the puzzle that's the solutions. <coughs> Excuse me. So the city is obviously striving to, uh, to implement as much flood reduction as they can. Um, but again, there's gonna be a finite capacity to any one improvement. Once you go past that capacity, there's gonna be trouble. So, so again, the multifaceted, multi-spirit um, attack, I think will have the best, best chance at success. And in these large projects that we've been talking about, they are, they take a long time to analyze, a long time to design, a long time to, to instruct. So if you, if you have any inkling or any thoughts about anything in your own home you might wanna try that you think might help, we would be more than happy to come out and look at it with you in the interim. So uh, feel free to call the engineering de department and we'll, we'll do that. And uh, so anything you can do on a private property to protect yourself certainly in the interim would, would be uh, probably a, a good thing to do. That's it. <clears throat> Thank you, Michael. 
Any questions or discussions for uh, Mr. Hughes? Alderman um, Mullinick. My turn. Um, thank you. That was very helpful. Um, just a couple of things. One of the things that I really want to emphasize is that um, I think everybody who's in the city is, and you're well aware of this as well, is that the June and July incidences are something that we're not going to be able to protect ourselves 100% for. There's just no realistic way. And I think that one of the things that we need to stay focused on is the the changes in the way that the rainfall has been occurring and how do we protect ourselves for those, especially in these areas that are typically flooding on a regular basis, you know, and I, I constantly use the Pine Street and the Jackson Sailor, the Jackson area down there as examples, and, and I think that's what we need to keep our eye on the ball of, is how do we protect ourselves for those type of events uh, where those continually flood, um, knowing that we know that there's a number of different issues. Which brings up one of the questions I had related to, and it's on slide 25, you don't need to go there. That's the one that showed the potential detention, I'm going to call them detention areas. Um, one of the areas that I, I didn't see listed there that I'm curious as to why it wasn't listed was Eldridge Park. Um, it's, it's a large facility and is there any way that we could utilize Eldridge Park or at least as we're looking at the different facilities to uh, potentially store some water for a period of time, uh, is that another possibility or can we at least incorporate that into the review process? Yeah, it's definitely a possibility <clears throat> and should be looked at for potential uh, use. Okay. Oh, Healy? I'm sorry. I got, I got a few more. Okay. Well, just uh, I want to add real quick on Eldridge, and, and my history is a little rusty, but I believe Eldridge was at one point a landfill. So it absolutely is. There, there would be... Yes, it is, but uh, and that's the reason why I want the engineers to look at it because I'm well aware that it's it is definitely a landfill that's been filled over, but there's uh, some possibilities of maybe doing something under it depending upon what the costs are. So that's the reason why I want to make sure that we cover that. All righty. Um, you've got other things. Uh, what I'd like to do is rotate, and then I'll come back if just so right. we, we, we've got uh, other aldermen that want to kind of get in the mix here, and I'll, I'll I'll come back to you in a second, Alderman Morley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. One thing that uh, has been brought up a couple of times, it was brought up in a town hall meeting that Alderman Kennedy and I had, and then it was also brought up here, um, although I don't, uh, it wasn't really discussed. Uh, slide 24, actually, I would like you to bring it up, uh, Mr. Hughes, if you could. Bullet point three. <clears throat> I'm just curious, and I don't expect a, a, a complete answer tonight. tonight but I read bullet point three, and uh, aside from all of the what ifs that would need to happen, um, Elmhurst is obviously in a very unique situation where the creek itself runs along one of our borders uh, right next to the DuPage owned quarry. And uh, my question is are you aware of any? I assume the engineers and the task force will look at this. Um, are you aware of any? Similar situation in Illinois where uh, a, a city is able to purchase credits, water credits in any case, where we could divert uh, water off of the creek and the north end of town and then either increase pumping capacity or add pumps to the south end of town. Um, it's just I, I, all the stuff we're talking about obviously is massive infrastructure changes. Um, this one seems like a less massive. Um, I'm just wondering if you're aware of that situation um, anywhere else in, in Illinois. Yeah, I'm, I'm not personally aware of it. I've got to believe that it, that it does exist. <clears throat> now, when it was permitted, I'm not sure. In, in you know, the, the, the Chris Burke firms and the other firms that are the experts know this better than I do, but the basic <clears throat> thing that you're not allowed to do is to increase stage or flood height downstream. So if you can prove that, yes, I've added a pump here, but I've done this over here, and you go down a quarter mile, half mile, mile, it doesn't have any impact. If you can prove that, then you probably could get it permitted. So if we could get it into the quarry and, and take it out or add, take out over here and add over here, it's got potential. Thank but you. I, I would add that that's <clears throat> quarry is owned by the county, and the county's got their standards, and Elmhurst does know that in September 08, one of those massive rainfall events, in September 08, the county went, the county's quarry went into play. It, it, it began to fill up. 
it continued to fill up, and our observation in Elmhurst was that it filled up. <laughs> so that September 08, that quarry was full. If it was full, I, I think if I'm the county, and I'm representing Elmhurst, not the county, but Elmhurst will do whatever Elmhurst can to help the Elmhurst situation, but understand reasonable expectations. The county's got to be looking out at, at the county, and if that quarry fills in September of 08, I think they'd be hard-pressed to allow any community to use it in an event to save their community when, again, in September 08, the county used it completely and filled it up. Follow up real quick, Mormon Mormon. Uh, well, I agree that it did fill up in that one event. Uh, there's probably countless events where we did have flooding in Elmhurst where it didn't fill up. So that was kind of my point. Besides the what ifs, mm -hmm. uh, if, there could, if we could strike a balance with the county where that would get cut off at some point, I think we would certainly understand that. But um, like I said, obviously the, seat, the, the streets of Elmhurst don't flood, or the streets of Elmhurst flood certainly more often than that quarry's been filled up to the top. So I'm just wondering if there's a way to strike a balance and uh, potentially come up with a solution. Thank you. It is a good uh, good point, and I, I think um, if there's any way we can get water in the back door to quarry, we will have it go into the creek first. If there's a will, there's a way. Uh, we'd, we'd love to have that opportunity, but uh, I think we need to set our ex expectations low, if, and if we get it, 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 you know, hopefully we can, you know, Ideally, uh, with the engineering firm, w w once we pick that person, hopefully we can get uh, relations <coughs> with the county where that might be a potential, and it I, I definitely is a good idea. So, especially for the Pine Street residents, there might be a way to sneak water from, from Pine over. So, uh, we'll be looking at all these different things. Any other discussion or questions? Alderman Brown. Thank you, Ms. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, my question's on slide seven, uh, which is the storm sewer system overview. Um, the first question on this slide is the first sentence, the major storm sewers are highlighted in orange. What size are these storm sewers that are highlighted in orange? Because the previous slide on slide six, it ranges anywhere from six inches up to 96. And could you also touch on if Elmhurst has any storm sewers that are forced mains per se, and are those located anywhere on this map? Because it's odd to me to see pretty much north of Elmhurst doesn't really have any orange lines or the major storm sewers whatsoever. Right. <clears throat> there are no uh, force mains on the storm sewer side of things. It's all gravity <clears throat> till it gets to the creek. Um, these would be, <clears throat> excuse me, probably getting on the order of the, you know, the, the 48s and above. You know, we have 48s up to 96s. Um, and, and obviously any one line, for instance, if you take, uh, <clears throat> say number, I think it's number eight here is the Utley lift station. Mm -hmm. This line is increasing as you go back here. It may only be, you know, a 36, but by the time it's here, I've walked it in, I've walked it through uh, <clears throat> the park next to the courts there. It goes through there and you can stand up in it. So it's getting to be, you know, 72 inches in there. So that line will be changing as it gets closer to the creek, getting larger. So in, in all areas, in, in all of these areas, um, closer to the creek, the larger it is. So I could make an assumption that anywhere from 72 and above is all located near the creek. Yeah, you're probably getting pretty close to the creek. So how does all the uh, stormwater funnel out from the northeast and, for that matter, northwest section, since it doesn't seem to have any larger sewers until... I don't know, it's too small to see exactly the location there, but around York and something. Um, basically, I mean, it, there are some some larger sewers up here. This area goes straight across to the creek. North Carolina Woods more or less shoots straight across, so it doesn't get that large. Up here, you have the the industrial park drainage ditch, and most of the sewers, most of the, the sewers go to there or down to the, into this area, but so the runs aren't that long, and of course that ditch there, I think the piping part that's at uh, over by York Street is on the order of 72 or 96 inches, and then it's open ditch after there, so some of it drains into there, so you have a large capacity but no pipe. So, but there, there are some good sized sewers up here. These kind of more or less tie into the lift stations. Okay, thank you. Helen Tezza? <clears throat> thank you. Uh, I know we used Washington Street as an example on page 12 and then 
on 28, we refer to flood enhancements, which first I would like to say we did every one of these and then some to my home several years ago, and they really do work and made a huge difference. So excellent um, suggestions. But my question is, it made me think back. Recently, I saw a notice that, um, you know, when we say what you can do on your own property so there are no negative impacts to your structure, structure or neighboring properties. I recall recently seeing uh, that we just adopted a new policy to go along with what FEMA recommends with new construction, what foot above. That's from high flood of record. High, okay. I'm just wondering how have we identified specific areas for that or how are we going to identify where that new rule will be in place? Well, the, uh, the rule is, uh in the floodplain, the rule has been in place since since at least 1992 that you have to build one foot above what's called the base flood elevation, but that it's only mandatory in regulatory flood areas. We obviously, in light of the current situation since 2006, and we're seeing these more flood prone areas, we are adopting that into our own administrative view of the, you know, of a house that would be, would be being uh, constructed in an area that we know is a little more flood prone, we would be working with the builder. There's no city ordinance that mandates it at this time, but obviously a builder would want to build something that's going to be safe, and, and to the degree we can help them with that, we will. Okay, thank you. I think that's a self-imposed uh, um, procedure, which, which is good, especially, you know, on some, some of these vulnerable streets. Any other discussion? Just one, one more simple question. Uh, you talked about rear yard drains, um, and one of the questions that I've had from a number of homeowners is um, cleaning those out, uh, and who cleans those out, who's responsible for that, and I know that they're, they don't really do a lot as it relates to the flooding itself, but they are the nuisance type thing. It would be helpful if uh, the residents knew who's responsible for those. Um, when, when the city installs a rear drain, it becomes the property owners and the maintenance also becomes the property owners. I've just told people over the years, take a garden hose, stick it in there as far as you can and blast the water for 10 minutes and that's probably about the best you can do with it. Okay, thank you. Very good. Alderman Guttenkorn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm trying to frame this question, I apologize. You said something about um, the impact of new construction versus old construction. I can't remember off the top of my head which slide it is, that um, you know, commonly oh. people are 21. Commonly, there's an assumption that new construction is putting somehow more runoff into the system than older homes were, and that um, lot coverages don't appear to be substantially different based on our observation of new construction over time. Yet, I frequently hear from residents that um, they have increased overland flooding problems when a new house is built next to them. Is this going to be assessing this or evaluating this going to be a component of um, this whole process of looking at flooding in Elmhurst? It is anecdotal to be sure, but I hear this complaint frequently and it does concern me of people who live in a house that was existing when a new house gets built experience or seem to be experiencing more water problems? Well, I think um, and that, that is kind of our uh, dilemma, if you will, because, you know, we, our, our mantra is that the builder, we want to build a good house, we want to make money, we want people to have a nice house, but you can't do it at the expense of your neighbors. So you can't take your water and shove it over there and, and let them have to deal with it. So a decision was made quite a number of years ago when this whole building boom kind of took off that you're basically going to capture your water on your property. Ergo, or an area drain if you need it, the downspouts will be tied in, your sump pump will be tied in, all hard piped to the storm sewer. So is that debate? Is it that that's adding volume to the storm sewer? Yeah, it's maybe not, it's, it's, a, it's an impact. Is it large? I don't know. But if we didn't do that, we would have that uh, situation where we would be having people more negatively impacted. I think if you go back and you look at a lot, and I can't say it's been every home, but the vast majority, the runoff when, when the new construction is done is significantly lower than before because all of that, all of that impervious that used to the driveway, the garage that all ran off doesn't run off anymore. So that same study we did with the 10 homes, I think that's where we did it. We calculated the pre and post 
uh, runoff, and it was greatly reduced because we're sending it hard pipe now to the storm sewer. So um, it, I know people have that view of it. The big house is there. It's hard to believe that uh, it hasn't. Had, and I, I will say, you know, anecdotally, um, again, 2005, we were severe drought. 2006, October, I mean, we have had probably 10 events since October of 06 that were significant. February rains, March rains. But anyone who, who moved in in 2003, 4, or 5, they never saw water because we were really dry. So I think there's a tendency to go, I never had w water before, and, and now I do. And is it really whatever they saw? We did work on the street. A house was built. The school put an addition on. Or is it that's just that it's raining more? But, but ba basically, by our plan review process, you're to create a bathtub with that house to the degree you can. Sometimes lots are so steep you, you can't get to the back to get the drainage. But if it's just grass running off, then that's probably not going to make a huge impact. Very good. Anybody else? Alvin Brown. Yeah, just a, a quick clarification, uh, and I, this is for City Manager Borchardt. Um, you were speaking before about the sewer system design today, and I believe I was just taking notes here that you said that the sewer system design for each lot to shed approximately 30% to the sewer system. Is that accurate? Is that what you stated? That, that would be the, the zoning code. Elmer's zoning code back in the 60s and then today require that there not be more than a 30% lot coverage with structures. So uh, the house, the garage can't be larger than 30%. So back when the Baxter and Woodman folks designed the Elmhurst storm sewers in the 60s, they didn't design for the existing situation. They designed for maximum build out. So they assumed that there would be every lot in town would get built upon, what would that maximum building be, what would it look like, and what would the stormwater be? And in that regard, it's consistent with what is, is happened in the, in the 2005, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. As there's new houses, those new houses are in most cases using the full capacity of the lot for structures but they're not going beyond that 30%, which is what the system was designed for back in the 19, 1960s. Thank you. Michael, could you go back to slide 18 real quick, that which kind of depicts the history of the storms we've had? Um, and I think if we had to pick our poison based on what I've seen here in 08, where, you know, we, uh, that's when Corey took the most amount of water that was over a 24 hour period, roughly seven and a half inches. It seems like these shorter storms that happen in half hour and six hour increments that produce a lot of rainfall are, are really what's kicking us in the tail. Uh, and it's just because our capacity in our, in our street stores is, is roughly a 10 year capacity. Um, and that, that June storm, and I, I had people that said, you know, I never got water in my yard. So, you know, and now, now you look at the June storm and say, well, we never had a 500 year event in, in, in 30 minutes here in this town that I know of, you know. So I, I think it, it is, it's not a common thing to see this happen, unfortunately, uh, and these, these record numbers are, I, I think this, this chart is pretty telling, you know. Uh, I know when I saw it, I was like, this I think puts, puts things in, pers in perspective. Um, so, you know, if we had to pick our, our tough situation, a, a 24 hour or 48 hour event as much, we have the capacity, it's just getting it there uh, is the big issue. Right. Okay, very good. Uh, and then the last one I wanted to look at was uh, slide three, which is the elevations, because I thought that was pretty telling as well. And it shows, you know, the green areas the low, are the low spots in our, in our town. The, uh, the red or orange areas are, are higher elevations, and, and uh, naturally water fl flows in the re least resistive areas, and, uh, and this is where it's challenging as well, too. But now the question is, you know, we, we, we can't change necessarily elevation, and this, I'm sure, will be something the engineer is going to have to look at. But but how do we move the water around? Uh, is it lift stations? Is it what, you know what what are our options and where do we put it? And I think that's exactly the question for the for the consultant. How do we how do we move it around? And, and you're right. Where does it go then? Because unfortunately, you can't just put a main trunk in out to the creek and let it go anymore. So 
you kind of got to two-step it. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Uh, anybody else for questions or discussion? Because this is a public meeting, um, I would like to open this up for discussion or questions from the audience as well, too. We will answer any questions uh, after we close out of this meeting as well in a, in a private task force meeting that we're going to have short, in, a, in a short few minutes. But at this point, is, at this time, is there anybody who has any questions uh, for the public that would like to? Uh, you, sir, if you'd like to grab the microphone. That'd be great. Hi. Um, I guess I'd like two questions answered. Sure. Um, number one, the 500-year storm in June on Pine Street did not produce flooding, but the July one did. Does, is there any ideas why that might be, and isn't that really in conflict with a lot of what you've said today? No. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Or Go ahead. Um, that storm hit very south in Elmhurst. We had a lot less damage and a lot less rain north of, say, St. Charles. And there's been reports that the, the tornado went like right down Roosevelt Road. I don't know if that was really a tornado, but that from like St. Charles down to south of the Oakbrook Mall was the main thrust of that storm. So we got the four and a half inches on the south side, but not on the north side. Correct. And you know that. Yeah. Is, I mean, seriously, rain data, you've got everything. rain data that shows that? Yeah, How much did the north side get? I, I don't recall. If could, you tell, could you let us know? Yeah, I could find out. Okay. Sure. Um, and the second question is, um, when we talk about the lot sizes in the new homes, um, we're talking about the building, the footprint of the driveway, and the structures, correct? Correct. And that's, the impervious, and, right. and that's the same, you're saying, with the old houses and the new houses between all of that impervious ground? He said, I think we looked at 10 homes. There was a couple that went yeah. one way or the other. But, but, but the code is the same, and it should yeah. be approximately the same. The yeah, code is the same. So, so the fact that the actual roof of the new home is maybe 50% more of the old home, and all of that water is being conveyed very efficiently, I, pr I presume, into the storm sewer system, a 50% increase. Forget about the total lot size. A 50% increase, you still believe that that has that's, well, best practice, to use your term. Um, it just seems to me that's, you know, it's one thing to say 30% is the same 30%, but when you look at the actual amount of water that's coming from these larger roofs very efficiently into a code, uh, you know, inspected storm sewer system, it seems like there's something there. Well, yeah, I, I said there is definitely an impact how great it is versus the, the sanitary that probably was there, you know, the old footing drain that was probably going to the sanitary. It's a, it, I, I believe it's a slight negative impact. Uh, I well. understand the balance and I understand the trade-offs, but we're talking about the storm sewer system. That charges the sanitary sewer. We know about that at the old houses. So the question in the storm sewer is, isn't it reasonable to think that the, this policy is actually part of the problem? And, and if, if you don't know, how can you find out? Well, that's, that's definitely something we want the consultant to examine as part of the comprehensive plan. Is this a good way to do it? Is there a better way to do it? You know, when, when will that be done? When will that study be known? I mean, that's, well, I don't know if you wanted to update now, Tom, or? Yeah, the, uh, uh, the gentleman is referring to is the, is the coefficient of runoff and then the speed at which the storm water is getting into the storm system. It, it is with the hard pipes, it's getting into the storm sewer faster. Is that? Yeah. Our, our events are from top to bottom, is the best way to describe it, is four hours. So there's an overload for a brief period of time. And on, on uh, I guess the third point, and I know other people want to talk, but you know, we talk about building berms and stuff like that to move the water away from the houses. Our problem is the water comes up my backyard drain. It's being conveyed into my yard by the sewers, by the storm sewer system. It's being conveyed onto our property by the storm sewers. The water shoots out of it. So I don't, I mean, you, we can build all the berms around for the, the overland, but all the water from the rest of the city is going to be still delivered to our neighborhood very efficiently. So <laughs> it seems like I, I, I just don't understand the solutions. I, I like your, the variable pumps. That makes sense to me. Um, basically, you're saying let the pump run all the time at some level. Um, maybe that would alleviate the peak. I mean, any idea how much that would cost? And 
Well, to answer a couple, yeah. couple of your questions. The the one the one study, and again, has been completed by by Burke in their interim assignment. The report is complete. It should be on the website. It's actually going to be reviewed by the Public Works and Buildings Committee at their committee meeting later tonight for the variable speed drive for the Jackson Street Station. That concept will be looked at in, in broader application opportunities as, as the consultant is selected going forward. Uh, relative to the actual uh, comprehensive planning consultant assignment, uh, there's a technical review committee, three members of staff, two members of the city council, and I, that group did meet before the uh, first meeting this evening, and Mr. Kennedy was the identified spokesperson for the group and would ask Mr. Kennedy to uh, maybe explain where, where they're at, which will allow for a consultant ideally to come on board here. Okay, thank Chairman you, Kennedy. Manager Borcher. Yes, um, the team met tonight. We discussed uh, our progress to date and what we're gonna do going forward. There were six firms that started the process. We uh, reviewed each of their um, packets for their RFQ, and we've identified four of those six to be firms that we're going to go ahead and have interviews with. We've identified um, dates in December. We're going to have those, those firms in, and our goal is to have a decision on which firm we're going to start with negotiation on December 13th. So what we're going to use is the balance of December to uh, take on that negotiation so that when we come back after the New Year's break, we will have a, uh, hopefully have a, a consultant that we've identified to go forward with. Um, we know from what we've seen in their RFQs, the process to develop a, a, a uh, comprehensive plan will be somewhere in the seven to 11 month range from what we've asked for them. So this is a long-term um, type of thing. So we got a lot of work to do here to, to identify the, the group and then uh, properly scope exactly what we're gonna do with that maybe seven months and maybe five, depending on what we want them to do, if we want them to be a little bit more focused, but it's gonna be a significant amount of uh, time and effort and cost to uh, get a comprehensive plan. But again, the, the, uh, the self-imposed by the committee to the council would be to identify the firm best identified to be successful, to allow the council to approve a contract with that firm, ideally in January, that firm then to begin their work. As we explained earlier to the task force, uh, the city is looking for early successes, uh, gains that could be implemented mm -hmm. that would provide for relief for the community to be considered. Overall, all four of these consulting firms I have, have identified the range of work that they believe would be necessary is gonna take on a low end four months to maybe, to maybe six, seven, eight, one even suggested 11 months, but it's not gonna start at and, and we're not going to hear anything for 11 months. There'll be a lot of reporting out and then implementing of, uh, ideally implementing of, of tasks that are identified for, for early implementation uh, in the first quarter, in the first half of, of next, next calendar year. Okay, thank you. Uh, that, that sounds good. I think you should just consider this uh, program to disconnect the, uh, the drains from the new homes. I, I think other communities have done that in the area uh, with faced with the same problem. I think you should understand it for sure and consider it seriously. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Anyone else that would have any questions or would like to uh, speak at this time? Again, there will be an opportunity for those on the task force. Uh, we are going to be meeting shortly after we close out of this meeting to ask questions. Um, but because this is a public meeting, I am opening this up in case people have questions. Uh, but we'll have, we'll have a second round here shortly. Anybody else? All right, hearing, uh, hearing none, I ask for a motion to adjourn. We go on the committee, and, uh, and then the task force, if you could please stay here. Uh, we will, uh, City Manager Borch and myself, uh, will uh, meet with you here shortly. Uh, motion by Alderman, Kent, uh, by, uh, Alderman Morley, second by Alderman Gutenkoff. All in favor, say aye. 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 We're adjourned. Anybody, anybody opposed? We're adjourned. Thank you.